Sippers, welcome to this episode of the Tea With Me podcast with me, Shane Todd. It's a guest episode. In the words of DJ Khaled, it's another guest episode. And that is what he says at the start of all of his songs. Real fun episode this week. In a second, I'll tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll just get straight into it. Or you could just be really sly and fast forward this, in which case you'll never see this. But in fact, you won't hear this anyway, so fuck you. But yeah, guest episode. Before I go into it, let me just plug two things. Number one is the Patreon, patreon.com slash tea with me podcast. We'll put it in the link for this description as well. That's where you get loads and loads and loads of bonus content. And some people say that, and it's not really bonus content. What we're doing is the breakfast brew every morning. It's a tea with me breakfast brew, Monday to Friday. The episodes come out at half nine if you're on the Patreon. You pay anything from three quid a month and you get this. You also get a bonus episode of the podcast every Monday, usually with a stand-up comedian friend of mine. Sometimes it'll be solo ones. Um, sometimes it could just be a guest from totally left field. It could be genuinely um, Coney. Remember him? Coney, tw- get Coney or whatever it was. We could get Coney on. And don't get me wrong, we wouldn't be like, you know, calling Coney like, oh, what are you at? No, I'd be, we'd be going at him like we'd be really giving it to him. So yeah, Joseph Coney, you never know, Joseph Coney could be on the podcast. And let me assure people that if he is, we'll, we'll not be being nice to him. Like. So that's all of the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Tea With Me podcast. Also, there's going to be mini series over there as well. I'm going to be doing a fitness series that we'll probably put over there. We've already recorded quite a lot of stuff for. Um, so I'll put it over there, like a comedy fitness series, by the way. I'm not genuinely going to be like, watch me run 5K. So I also got to plug the uh, sponsor of this podcast, which is Manscaped, manscaped.com. You know by now what Manscaped is. Manscaped sponsor 95% of podcasts in the world. And what people are doing is just telling you that they have the best male grooming products in the world, essentially, including the Lawnmower 3.0, which is a lawnmower for your basement garden, if you know what I'm talking about. It's a lawnmower for your pubic region and you need to take you especially need to take care of that at this time of year because a lot of guys will be like no I'll wait for the good weather before I tackle that listen get stuck into it now and then all you need to do is maintain it up to the summer and then when the summer comes all you need to do is go into a public park and just open open your trench coat and say what do you guys think don't do that but manscaped.com Tea with me for 20% off of free shipping. Check out all their products. And whatever you can think of for men's grooming, they have it. And they're obsessed with balls. Like myself, they're obsessed with balls. All they're doing is thinking about balls all day, every day. So go and have a look at what they're all about. Tea with me for 20% off of free shipping. And patreon.com slash tea with me podcast. My guest this week is Connor McNeil. Connor is an actor you more than likely have seen in something before. Um, he, he's been acting for, for a long time, despite being my age. And, and, you know, always when I find out people are my age, I'm like, I, I should have done more. You know what I mean? Like, why have I not done more things? But Connor's been killing it for a long time. He is a very good actor, stage, stage and screen. You know, he's, he's been in The Ferryman on Broadway. He is at the minute in industry, which is on BBC and HBO. And that show is killing it. That show's all over the place. It's going down really well. Um, I'm about halfway through it and, and I'm really enjoying it. And Connor plays a very, very fun character in it. And, uh, and if you've seen it, you'll know that it, it's a, it, for me, it's, it, it, it's a standout character. I'm not just saying that. I think he's great. Connor is just also a very, very nice guy. Very down to earth guy. And they're just very easy to chat to. I enjoyed having a cup of tea with them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my episode of Tea With Me with Conor McNeil. Conor, my first question for everybody that comes on the podcast is, do you drink tea? If you do, maybe you can tell me a little bit about your relationship with tea. You know, how you got started. Have you, has it ever become a problem? You know, have you experimented with other hot drinks? Just let me know what, let me know what your vibe is. Uh, I'm, re- I'm already starting on a bad foot now already. I do drink tea, but I don't like builder's tea, so it's controversial enough. I, 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 and I've, you, you don't like that tr- the traditional 
Tetley, Punjana type thing, dash of milk. No, are you yeah. a- Actually, to genuinely dislike it. I like a green tea. Shane, I'm really, really sorry. I've changed. <laughs> That's just... Uh, so, so genuinely, I, um, I don't have dairy, right? And uh, so I have the all green tea every now and again. And I was at the Edinburgh Fringe about seven years ago and went to see Hearts play Portic Thistle. And there yeah. was like a, like a tea van at the game. And I, there was like a Sc- middle-aged Scottish woman working there, like hard as nails. And I went up to her and I said, I, uh, I was like, do you do, could I get a green tea? And she said, she said, this is an SPL match. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, felt, then I felt so stupid for asking. Um, so on, on the podcast, I want to just chat to you about, well, loads and loads, and loads of different things. I feel like I've only got to know you a little bit in like the last couple of months. But yeah. because you've done genuinely like so many things for for quite a long time on like on tv film things uh, i i've known your face for as creepy as that sounds i've known your face for a long time and i think the first time i remember seeing your face was when you were doing and correct me if i'm wrong unless you're like yeah, I, that wasn't me ready, ads it was like ads <laughs> for like mental health where you, were you walking around with a cardboard box that got bigger that'd be me I used to do a bit of stand up that was not funny. <laughs> oh, this is awful already, right? Go ahead. <laughs> I now this I maybe just did this once and it didn't work, but it stands out to me as a bit that should have got more. I remember talking about that ad when I just started doing stand up and thinking the character in the ad wouldn't have as many problems if he then stop just stop walking about with his cardboard box. <laughs> now that should have got more. You laughed, but the crowd didn't. Um but yeah, I just remember like seeing so many things that you've you've done. Like, have have you been you've been acting since like a, a young age? I since I was fourteen. So done. Like I, I used to do plays in the summer up at it was a double joint theatre company. I used to do plays every summer for the West Belfast Festival. And so we, I, I like done a play there, and then the next summer did another one. So kind of done in, and then done wee bits like got because I picked up like wee bits and pulling moves and. Give my head piece for a wee bit. Knew all those weeks, just turned up for a wee bit here and there. So did that, and then but got that ad. Was I remember that ad was the first big like paycheck ad. Like I, it was, it was, yeah. I was about it, and it was on the side of buses and stuff. Yeah, as absolutely <laughs> wasn't until absolutely everybody roasted me about it all the time. <laughs> so I thought this was class, and then everybody's like, "Is that you? You're a dick." <laughs> the idea wasn't it that the, the, your problems get bigger, so the box you were carrying. I mean, it makes it makes a lot of sense. The more I spoke. So at first I spoke to a friend and then a box got smaller and then I went to my, somebody else and spoke to them and then the box got smaller again. And then I went to my doctor and spoke to my doctor and the box got smaller to, to the fact that it got so small, got the size of a matchbox and I was able to just stick it in my pocket chain and carry on my life. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about that is in Belfast, Northern Ireland, yeah. like people, like friends, you know, like roasting you for like being on like an ad. The fact that it's for like a great cause, like for exactly. mental health and for cuts no muster to people like doesn't earn you any sort of buy ball like you could be you know on comic relief in in kenya you know what i mean like walking around dishing out dishing out freddos and your mates would still be like oh you dickhead I yeah i was at oxygen that summer i think and these group of lads absolutely been <laughs> circled around me and started chanting if your head's away just say my mates genuinely had to get into the middle and get me out <laughs> <laughs> did you develop problems <laughs> as a result? I, I ended up with mental health problems because you did. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this this story that I got told is true, right? I don't know if this is true. But is it about I, me? No, it's not about you. It's not yeah. about you. <laughs> Terrified. <laughs> as an actor in 2021. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> I, heard, um, I heard that a certain local, let's call him, weatherman and broadcaster um i'll not say who it is but i heard that once this probably isn't true but apparently do you remember dempsey's nightclub yes I do. i've never been but i remember where it was yeah. before our time i think but it's filthy's now um i heard this guy got his drink spiked and uh and was was walking about with with maybe ecstasy and I, there's no way this is true but apparently like the whole dance floor circled around him and started singing It's a Scoot Around the Corner just to say, and he was just giving it like 
complete stacks, but I don't think that's true. That's obviously not true, Shane. But part of you would like it to be, you know what I mean? Like, part of you would really like it to be. Fucking amazing. I have to talk to you about pulling moves as well, because um, that was, pulling moves was such a cult thing, where nowadays, if you mention it to people, not everybody remembers it, but if you do remember it, you absolutely loved it. I remember it stood out to me as like a local comedy thing, um, where although it was set here, although it was very much a Belfast thing, it, it didn't feel like everything else that was being made at the same time. It was just proper funny. It was really, I can really remember funny. at the time, I think, I think this is, I'm near sure this is true, I don't think I'm misremembering this, but Pierce Elliott, who created it, um, had said that like, it had done so well on BBC Northern Ireland that they obviously brought it to the big BBC and they were like, well, we're going to go BBC One National, right? And all the people are like, what's the show that's like getting this buzz? And they watched it over in England and they all went, these people are de- terrible. <laughs> None of them have jobs. They're all doing the double. <laughs> They're all stealing and robbing to make money on the side. And this is supposed to be good. And they were like shocked at what it was about. And we were like, no, but it's, fu- it's funny, right? Isn't that funny? <laughs> They're, they're, they're pulling moves and like it's illegal, it's crime. <laughs> <laughs> and they just didn't go for it. Like, <laughs> um, But yeah, I thought it was, it was very, oh, very so clever, good. very funny. I just think like, even when you look back now, there's so many brilliant actors in who have all went on to do really well. Who were in that. Like Simon Delaney and all was in it early doors and K. McManaman, wasn't it? And George Jordan was class in it. Yeah, yeah, really good. Hope but, but you must you must have been young. You're, you're not the same age. Aren't you? You're 32? We're 32? 32, yeah. You were young. you must have been young when you did that. I think it was fourteen. Fourteen. It was just in a car, and I think it was me and Kevin Elliott maybe in a car. I'm not. I can't remember. God, it's been ages since I seen it. And I was like schmecked to the back teeth with gold rings on every finger, and um, yeah, it was class, class car. And then was a man about dog from the same, not the all the same actors, yeah. but the same team. I so it was Pierce Elliott as well. He done that. That's he done shrooms and. Good, very funny. I loved Man About Dog's class, wasn't it? Get, I mean, getting into, yeah, yeah. It was pretty, I mean, it's one of those things that, like, I would love to watch now just to see how it's aged. Yeah. But, but I'd say it, I mean, it was just, for, Kieran, Kieran Nolan was just, when he popped up in something, I was already laughing. Yeah, he's too funny, like. Uh, I, getting it, I mean, get, like, getting into acting and performing at 14 is something I'm very jealous of because I, I would never have, as much as I do, people might not believe that doing stand up now, but like at that age, there is not a. I would love to have like acted, I would love to have done that kind of thing. But at that age, I, I, I didn't feel like comfortable enough in my own skin or something to, to put myself out there and say, look, this is something I'm going to do. So when you were, you know, saying to your mates from school or outside of school or whatever, uh, that, you know, you're acting, all that kind of thing, what, what, was the, what was the reception to that? I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. So like, only, only the people found out kind of thing, but I kind of at school at 14 was genuinely absolutely embarrassed as fuck about it. But like, and, and then then the ad came out, I was still at school as well, and there was nothing to do to hide that. So it was like, I don't know, I was a bit embarrassed at the start. And then now, like, it's mad, isn't it? That like the, a lot of the people who I would have thought would have given me shit for it were actually, that's class, you're doing that. That's class, I can't believe you're doing that. And then now, especially when I see people like they're so proud of, yeah, and what you've done and stuff. It's like, but I remember it's school being like, loving doing it and feeling like, because it was summer holidays and it was just me and this group of people and nobody, and then go back to school and realize I was scundered about it. And then yeah. stopped doing it because that I didn't do it between like 15 till I was 18. And the only reason I'd done it again was Pam Brighton begged me to come back and do a play with them. And she wrote this play and she was like, do it, do it. And then when I did it that time when I was 18 myself, or 17, maybe I knew myself a wee bit more and was like, I fucking love this. It's all I want to do, like. Yeah, I mean, you're very, very jealous. I mean, even like school plays, like I, I, looking back, I was like, that would, I would have been class. I, I mean, I was in the, qu- I was like blending into the background of the choir, but secretly it was just like wanting to be. Did you not just join the choir? Because I was in the choir and it was just to get free periods. Uh, you got so many free periods if you were in the choir, it's choir practice. Yeah, and I was brutal at singing. So I don't know. There was like a buzz about me in the <laughs> choir, you know, from like. <laughs> from. From like from the from the high, from the teacher like Miss Ireland who was our who was our choir teacher or choir master or whatever it is, for some reason she must have got me confused early doors with somebody else because I would have been like no solos but I was front and center and a lot of stuff and I genuinely could not sing like I couldn't sing like okay I could not sing well and I'm mine 
I, I, I used to mime in our school choir all the time. But yeah, I think like you're saying about, you know, mates actually saying, yeah, like you're fair play for doing that. I think when you actually do sort of put yourself out there and say like, here, I'm doing this, this is what I'm doing and you do it well, nobody can really deny that that deserves a bit of respect. Do you know I what I mean? Like no matter what it is, if it's sport or, or whatever, um, or things I think like that. It's probably easier with sport. Like for, yeah, oh yeah. For fellas anyway, but yeah. But no, it was sweet. I was terrified about it and then it was sweet. Cool. Has, has acting always been your thing or was there something else? Like, were you like going to be a vet or something at one point? Yeah, you know what you, Mad, you said? Animals when I was a kid, kid. Like, I, I wanted to be a farmer. That's all I wanted to be. It's like, I'm going to be a farmer. I'm going to have cows. Yeah. Uh, farmer, vet. And then when it, but as I got older, I really wanted to get into, I love, still love music, mad about it. And I wanted to get into A&R, you know, like those guys that like find the bands and you go out and you travel the world and go to gigs. I just thought that sounded class, like go drinking pints, listening to bands, bringing them in, being like, I'm going to make you famous. Come and yeah, work. yeah, yeah. Like, being, being that guy, getting paid loads of money. Um, and then A&R, like, thank fuck I didn't follow that. Cause I started, I was doing business studies and marketing and stuff to, with that in my mind. And then, like, Spotify and everything really killed all that. doesn't exist anymore, like, that type of job. I'm sure it does in, in small part. It's not a... What thing. would you... Would you have, like, smoked a cigar when you were going to tell yeah, bands? Like, glasses everywhere. Blazer with the sleeves rolled up? I, a, a white blazer, blazer, maybe, as well? Yeah. Let me ask you back, like, the odd time I'll get asked to do something, whether it's, like, a, a pilot script or something... And obviously, like anything, and anything I write or anybody else, sometimes an idea is good, sometimes it's bad. But let me ask you, um, obviously, I understand if you don't want to go into detail about it and don't name names, but have you ever been in something, like even way back, that you can look back on and go, I really wish I hadn't done that? Like, and I know it can be, and I'm not looking at you to be like, well, this guy, but... I just mean, like, is there something then, like, that... The script was bad, or the show was bad, or... Even, even a part you've auditioned for and gone, like, what am I What am I doing here? Oh, God, I did do that. And it's not that the show was bad, it was what was I doing there. My agents coerced me. Like, genuinely coerced me as well, because I said, I, I can't, like you said, I can't sing, I can't sing at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I get sweats thinking about this. <laughs> coerced me the audition for... Josh Gad's role in the the West End transfer of the Book of Mormon, right? Which is a big tenor for role. Like that's a big tenor role. <laughs> so it's not just singing, it's a specialized. Oh, it's uh, like he sounds like meatloaf, Josh Gad, right? <laughs> right? It's like it's like it's amusing. And I was like, I can't, and they were like, I swear to God, Connor, like they spoke, it was a cast director called Pippa Alien, who's amazing. She was like, no, 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 no. Like they spoke to her and they were like, they're looking at I think they were really struggling to fill. Because actually, Josh God came and done it, I think, in the end, because they couldn't find it. I'm near sure he'd done the first six months. They couldn't fill So they started going, like, we'll just look for actors who can sing a bit because the acting's more important in that part than, and, you know, we'll teach them with the voice goes. <laughs> and so I had to go to, do you know Pineapple Studios? Do you know Pineapple Studios? Louis <laughs> Spence? Louis Spence was in the hallway when I walked in, shooting him, not even. Louis Spence was in the hallway I walked in, and he was doing, like, a mad plie thing. He's like, all right, darling, whatever. And I was like, oh, oh, oh my God. And I had to go <laughs> stairs get in the lift go up the stairs and they were auditioning for Mamma Mia in one room they were auditioning for recast and something else and then down the end was the um was the the big Mormon auditions and I, it was like a made-up thing it was like fame or something it was girls were like one leg up against the wall like leaning against it stretching everyone was doing vocal warm-ups and then I get down the end and there was a few like heavy lads bigger lads a bit odd looking lads and I went oh look they all look like, you know, like me, they're a bit awkward and a bit out of place here. So that's grand. So we're sitting, I'm like, this book of Mormon auditions. I'm like, yeah. And this guy's a big guy, a heavy guy in front of me, long hair, um, looked like he just crawled out of bed. And he was like, yeah, I mean, this is it. And, he, and they called him and he was next. And so he walked in and I went, oh, sweet. Well, actually, I'm going to be sweet here. I'll just fucking bring it. And I can hear through the door and he starts singing. It's one of the most incredible. It's, <laughs> it was sounded like Meatloaf was in the room, like this, like blasting out. <laughs> it was like, oh my God. My agents had told me that, uh, there was only uh, the director, musical director, and the casting director in the room. And it'd be dead chilled and all. So anyway, he leaves. I walk in the room. Fucking big long room. Grand piano. Eight people on a panel. The American producers were over. All these people. I'm like, okay, Connor, so good. And you need to do your acting. And you do the acting. And then turn and bust into the song. And I bust into the song. They stopped me straight away. Shane. They were like, stop. Sorry, just in the wrong key there, Connor. And the musical director was like, if you want to do uh, um, it's me, me. And I was like, me. <laughs> 
the point where we'd done that about three days, like me, 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 and I spent, do you know what? Let's just leave it here. I just think, I think just leave it here. And they were like, no, 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 you can. I was like, honestly, it's fine. Thank you so much. I just walked in and just stormed in the room, never looked back. That was it. Yeah, that was the most embarrassing, humiliating. Oh, that's nothing. As but I, I, I once auditioned, for, I've not auditioned for many things before, but whenever I was about 17, I decided I should be in the TV show Skins. Remember in Channel 4? Yeah. There's like op- open auditions in London. Me and my mate got the bus. Neither of us had ever acted in anything. We got a tw- it, it was like a 27 hour journey to get there. Um, flew to London, open auditions, and it was like improv scenarios. And uh, they said like, it was me and th- me, two girls and a guy I'd never met before, obviously. They're all English. And the scenario was one of the girls has to tell us who her best friends is. She's a heroin addict. Now, two things. One, I tried to play it for comedy, right? <laughs> And two, <laughs> and two, for some reason, I found myself, you know, like I stepped out of my own body and I felt like I was watching myself. I started to do an English accent that was not good. I should have just done my own. And it was, I, so I was, I was making light of the situation. I was ruining it for them. And then I was doing this really like half English, half Northern Irish accent. And uh, it, like you said, it's one of those ones where seconds into it, you're going, I've, I've, I need I've, to get out of here. I need to be here. That I, 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 look, looking back on it, I sh- yeah, I shouldn't have went in the first place. I shouldn't have been made to go. I didn't want to go. Yeah. And I, was, I trusted them and they were wrong. But I like to think that you still went out in the town with Louis Spence that night. Like, I like to oh, think I know. Of the way. You're so close today. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where's, where is he these days? I don't know what he's up to. Have you ever seen that amazing uh, video of, what do you call the girl The place Bianca? Patsy? Patsy Kensett. Patsy Kensett. Have you ever seen Louis Spence and Patsy Kensett a Beto workout video? No, but I will okay, be doing that after this. And also, actually, absolutely exhausted. But I, it is one of the best watches. YouTube out for yourself after. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Um, so let me chat to you about um, loads I could talk to you about. But one thing I want to talk about, of course, is, is industry, which is um, yeah. unbelievable. It's a, it's a BB, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, BBC HBO co-production. Yeah, it was a HBO show that BBC came on board in, in the middle of us filming. Ah, I would have. I naturally assumed it was the. It would have been the other way about. Yeah, so would I. It's it, so bad. Will who produced it? Are a, they're a Welsh uh, production company, that, but they they're kind of changing the industry in, in the UK. I think a wee bit. And that Bad Wolf have a great relationship with HBO, so they've done like his Dark Materials, Discovery, which is I Hate Susie, all that. And they're doing these big and 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 Jane, who runs Bad Wolf, is an exec on Succession, and like so that she has that brilliant and and so she's. Yeah, she she brought this to them first, and they took came on, and then BBC came on board, and um, and it's it, it it's one of those things that it's about quite a specific. Well, the world is like quite a specific thing of, you know, young people working in finance in in London and the, these working all hours kind of massively stressful jobs, which my mate did a bit. He went to, you know, a lot of people go from here to work in those kind of companies or or big yeah. accountancy firms in London. So he. I remember him telling me a little bit about that at the time. Um, but it's just, it's very like addictive watching. The episodes are very, like the next one starts before you know it kind of thing. So, so yeah. how, did, how did that come about for you? Like the audition process for that? And- I, was in, I was in New York doing the Ferryman and uh, all the boys were auditioning for it, apart from me. It was this Northern Irish uh, role. And I was like, oh, I'm exactly. And, uh, and then eventually the audition came and just came a wee bit later. And, and, I taped for it, done a tape, didn't hear anything then, had to do a Zoom with the, the writers and the, the creators, Mickey and Conrad, and they gave me a load of notes and taped again. And then I didn't hear anything for months and months. And then got a phone call to do like a chemistry read. And it was pretty much from there. It was a bit mad. It was from there, I went to do a chemistry, which was nearly the majority of the, the cast. No, it was like six or seven of us, so the, the kind of main cast were all there doing it and there was nobody else auditioning for the roles and we were like right. went up to Cardiff into the studios doing this thing and we all then left and were sent back to London and then got a phone call and got it and that was it it was like like they, they decided I don't know how but there was just but it was a, a it was a long wait in between that and then the next thing you were up doing it it must be class to not just be involved with the project like that but also when you know when it, it be it the toughest time ever I'm sure for actors where like I'm sure there's great actors that you know that haven't been able to do anything in the lockdown period. So to do a great series like this at a time like this must be like an extra bonus. 
we we shot it before lockdown, so we finished. It finished. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, it finished. We we finished. But it, what happened was lockdown postponed. It actually it was supposed to be out earlier, and that's why it came out. No, nah, it was the whole lock. I don't know what happened, but so we shot it. We we wrapped in January, so or like like two days before Christmas. So this time last year, we wrapped it, and I came home and was like so excited about the year. But having said that, what a brilliant thing that I think kept me seeing the whole way through it, knowing it was coming out knowing that that was coming, knowing that we, yeah. you know, and, and also there was always a nod to season two very early on, you know, we were all kind of, so having season two announced during lockdown, all that, it's like godsend, it really is like. And, what, and what's the, I was going to say, what do you get, a, when you do like a series or a film or whatever, does a lot of the reaction to that, uh, it's different if I, say I put a, a sketch out, the feedback's instant, you know, you're mm. not waiting for people to, for next week, for the next one to be on, it's there. The comments are all below it. So when you do like a TV show or a film, is it different? Have the reaction to that in lockdown, where like you're not bumping into people at the shop as much as you would, or you know, being clocked in the street and have a stranger say I really like that thing? Is it almost like you know that the show's gone down really well, but you're not really too sure yet? Yeah, it that is a weird. One. I don't feel like because. Anybody I speak to is like, you're in the, like, do you know what I mean? Like, people are buzzing about how successful the show is, and I don't, nothing's changed for me. Like, as yeah, in, like, yeah. anyway, I've been recognized once, literally once, and somebody's went, Are you your mom from industry? And I'm like, Yeah, in the airport on the way home. You mom from industry? And I, I was like, Yeah, and he's like, Happy Christmas, brilliant, legend. <laughs> that was it, that was it, don't you know? And you're like, That's the only, other than that, there's been no reaction to it. So, on that side of things, I don't see any, any difference. But I know the show's gone down well because you see the reviews and the and the. But yeah, it doesn't feel like I'm in a massive. And how's it gone down in America? Because it's almost like it's you know playing to two audiences, like the the audience here in England and that kind of thing. Going to BBC has it been on HBO yet? It aired first on HBO. It's went down like ridiculously well. Class. I, it. I think they love as well just the English accents and all of that stuff. They're like, you know, Americans love, don't they? That's why Downton yeah. Street there and um. Yeah, you know, out there, you know, it's like hearing different accents or a different world, they don't know. But yeah, it's went down like really, really well. Um any weird DMs? Yeah. <laughs> 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 like one somebody messaged me just saying, What was it he said? He said, watching a few T V series or T V shows now, you're an absolute cunt, mate. <laughs> it's like oh, brilliant. <laughs> I haven't seen the show yet. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like whatever, but so there's been stuff like that. But you, the maddest stuff has been I, I've I've got messages um uh, asking for lots of money, just being like, look, I'm in a really really tight spot. Can you give me twenty five grand? And you're like, of course, I'm here. <laughs> a lot of a lot of that stuff, and a lot of like, wow. yeah, there's been a few odd ones, a few odd ones. Never had that. I've never had anybody ask for money. Like, I felt really bad reading it, but then I'm like. What? I think it's just, they probably do it to everybody. Do you know, like those emails you get, it's probably the same. Yeah. I, on with, with your character then, were you like, was there much wiggle room for you to put a bit of a stamp on it or was it pretty set as to what it was? Because what strikes me is like how natural it is. There was a moment where, I might be wrong, but you're like, just like reading like football news or something. You're talking about Liverpool. There was just this one. Have I got this right? You sure that was me? Yeah, there's well, there was a moment where you were sitting at your desk and you're kind of not off screen, but you're not the main bit of that scene. And it was you just this. Liverpool. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but my brain's gone from that. But there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. But the majority of that, as much as I don't want to say this, I mean, there's a bit of improv, and I'm like, oh, I don't. Want but the boys wrote it. The boys wrote all of it. Everything. They're so clever. They like, you know, they they know those guys inside out. I think. Wiggle room was yes to a degree, but there was nothing you wanted to change. See, when I read the scripts, it was very seldom that you'd go, could I say it like this? And the only times I did that was our rhythm so different sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And they're too much, so they'd write something and the rhythm just always stuck and I'd find it awkward. So I'd go, can I say this word or put that word there instead? But apart from that, not really. And But what did happen was when I auditioned for it, he was written as like a six foot CrossFit dude. Right. And then I auditioned for it, which is Julie Hogan, who's casting director. You know, I love her and I'm so grateful to her. Like she, she was like, 
but what about if he was like this guy and she threw me in the middle of the mix of lads like that and they went oh my god oh my god and it changes the whole his whole character changes from in my height my look in comparison to those boys the working class all of those things and so then they started writing it to him gotcha that gotcha. version of him do you know what I mean so initially it wasn't that so there was wiggle room in that way but and I, could, I couldn't picture anybody else playing that like the the way you play it is like it, it, I'm sure a lot of people watching or, and listening will have seen it but it's almost like you're always like bubbling a wee bit under the surface like sometimes just a little bit and then sometimes a lot and uh, I just imagine a very fun character to play class crack class crack and that's like me and Marisa who I like just harass and bully through the whole show literally the worst corpses together biggest messers together and like it's so much crack doing it and it seems weird when you watch because everybody's like you're so awful there how did you do that and then you're like it's loads of crack well, so. see, see with Corpson, right? That that's my big fear. Like, if if I'm doing like a production that's you know, well, well, production, not stand up. If I'm doing like something for TV or film, I, I with like sketches and with stand up. Obviously, with stand up, you burst out laughing halfway through. It's fine. like anything can happen. But one of my fears is being responsible for other people as well. You know what I mean? So if I laugh, I might fuck this up for three other people. I might cause this to run over time wise have you ever got it like real bad where you just have to like ask anybody, anybody who's in the cast of the fairy man right oh well the fairy man is is a, a play which yeah that's way worse so there's a thousand five hundred people on broadway staring at you or thousand six hundred whatever it is like to the point where one actor who i adore <laughs> came in the my dress room afterwards and went, it has to stop connor it has to stop <laughs> 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 Sorry, I don't know what to... And was it was Played it different it. bits, or would it be what I imagine would be it's... really hard, which is the same one particular thing, one particular that, bit? Yeah, that did happen for a while. <laughs> it did happen for a while. But then it, I'm the, I'm the type of person where if something goes slightly wrong, yeah. I find that hilarious because right? I'm like. <laughs> Look at the, it's because you watch an actor's freak out. So something's fallen or broken or something. I'm like, because they're like, um, uh, 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 like trying to keep <laughs> acting and stuff. And that stuff cracks me up. Um, or if I see something funny, if I cock something funny in the audience, anything like that, I, I'm not very professional or very good. And <laughs> I've, I've, ruined, I've ruined people's onstage experience from just not being, And there was times as well, there was one time I just didn't speak. I had lines and all, and people look to go, and they catch a quick glimpse of me, look away and just go, we don't even need them, just keep going. Keep yeah, going. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done one play, I've done one play, uh, like locally, and I thought that I had a moment where I knew an actor had gone to the wrong page. So the guy I'm doing lines with, I, I know he's about two pages ahead, and that's going to ruin a bit of the scene. So I, in my head thinking on my feet, which kind of you do with, you have to do with stand-up quite a lot. Yeah. I go, let me bring him back. So I'll improvise a wee bit, but I'll bring him back a couple of pages. But I, I brought him to the wrong page, which was like another three pages ahead of that. So he took us to four, and I took us to seven. <laughs> it was so the Audience bad. being like, this is the most, it's very art house. This is very... <laughs> <laughs> he, he said about, I thought he'd missed a bit where we were supposed to be going golfing. Uh, but that comes way later. So he said something, and I teed him up for, no pun intended, for, uh, sure, we not meant to be going golfing? I mean, I probably thought I was doing it really subtly. I was like, are we not supposed to be going golfing? <laughs> what? what do you mean? <laughs> I, do I look. Like that, though. I, I, it's, it, that's part of the kick, though, isn't it? Like, when you think you don't want it to happen, but actually it's one of the most, like, the most adrenaline you'll get, the most, like, thrill in going, can I fix this? Can we get yeah, this? Yeah, contract? yeah. And that, whilst it's absolutely terrifying, is also loads of crack as well. What What was the um, the experience of the ferryman like? Like doing a run on Broadway, living in New York with, I imagine, a load of other actors from from home as well. Was that like a Was that an, an unbelievable time? Yeah, like it was like a traveling carnival. Like all of us, everybody, and also everybody kind of even when we started the ferryman, most people kind of knew or knew of each other from before. I, and we're all there together in it and uh and then getting to go to new york i mean just dropped in new york to do that show it was like it was epic it really really was and we had so much crack in it and the, the thing is the show was very serious and it's three and a half hours long so like the crack was curtailed to a certain degree because you're doing eight of them a week so it wasn't as like raucous as it could have been 
um, or that you could imagine it could become. But uh, but it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Doing a doing a job with like all your mates. Yeah, yeah. On Broadway, mean, like, on Broadway, on Broadway too. Like, getting paid to be there and like absolutely class it was class. Me, me and my dad went to New York in March uh, last year, last year, year before. Uh, yeah, last year, and um, I I was like, oh, I really want to go to Broadway. I really want to see like a play, and I love Frankie Valley. I would absolutely love like Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. So I was like, let us let's go to Jersey Boys. Couldn't believe the price of tickets online. We went, and I gotta be honest, I don't know where we were, but it was not Broadway because the guy who played Frankie Valley did not. He sounded more like Frank Mitchell. You know what I mean? Like he was, he, he did not. Like they didn't. He, if Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, I don't even know if there was four of them. I think it was just him and three fellas, and uh, it it was not good. But yeah, Broadway is something like I'd like to go to properly. You know what I mean? Like really go and see like a big thing. Yeah, I you go see stuff though. It is hitting. It's like anything else, just hit and miss, but it's on a bigger scale. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, but it, there is something magic about it. You know what's class about it over there that doesn't really happen? It doesn't happen in the West End or anything like that. Is like the Broadway community. All the class all hang out with each other. Everybody's in touch. Everybody's like, <clears throat> like our opening night, we got like, because Bruce Springsteen was on in the corner. We had like a wee letter from Bruce Springsteen saying, good luck in your opening night. All the theatres send each other notes for their opening night. Class. If something happens, everybody checks in on each other. They do like Sunday brunches where you can like pop into a theatre on a Sunday where they do a brunch before Sunday matinee. Like there's this community, a real sense of community, like which is kind of like nowhere. I've never experienced it anywhere else. Would Would you have had like any mates that were doing other plays, like in different? Like, is there like a little bit of a Belfast type thing, like another Ireland thing out there, or who was there? There, I feel like there was at Rackham. There was yes, Chris. What's Chris's second name? He was doing. He wasn't on Broadway, but they were downtown doing a play, and he's from from home. Um, he's also. In, uh, What's his second name? That's really bad. He'll hate me. Sorry, Chris. Uh, okay, we'll, but, we'll, we'll edit it in. We'll dub it. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> his name is. And then, but last night, when I did Cripple of Inishman, first 10 round, the Irish Arts Centre had a festival, in the first Irish festival, and like loads of people from home were over. Like, and, and that was amazing. It was like, and also it was my first time in New York ever. Loads of other people's first. We were all running about like lunatics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we went to do that play, they put, that was an Irish cast as well, they put all of us in these apartments facing an Irish bar. I think the producers at the end of the thing were like, what have we done here? <laughs> In there, um, I want to ask you a bit about like what you're up to now. Like you're doing a lot of writing now. Um, is that something you've always done or is that like a, a slightly newer thing to you or have, or have you just been writing as, as you've gone along? No, kind of new and not new since like maybe five years ago. Right. So writing, um, and then yeah, and then just kept doing it. I, I, and not kept doing it because out of like uh, desperation to it to start, but more out of people going, oh, it's actually quite good. Like, do you want to make yeah. this person and up it? And it becoming a thing. And now I write out of like, I love doing it now. Do you know what I mean? But it, initially I just done it because I was bored, to be honest. It was, wasn't working and wasn't getting jobs. And like, Want to try to write myself a role, and that you know, it's like hundred percent. Yeah, that was that was the same thing for me. I'd be newer to it than that still, obviously. But but writing the roles that you want to do because the roles that we all want to play, and you're like, well, if I can make it happen for myself, then that I've got way more of a better shot. Totally. What what's one role you would you would love to do? Whether it's a certain type of character, a real character, but playing them in a film version or whatever. Like, is there a project that like is the is the ultimate goal or or a big passion? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know what? No. I, there there was a, t- a a minute of time, but again, singing would be a problem here. I'd love to do a biopic about Van Morrison, and I look like a young Van Morrison. We don't look madly dissimilar. <laughs> uh, if you look at seventies, <laughs> uh, that would be fucking class, you know, and I don't think that's been done yet. I don't know how. I always think, though, those type of things are difficult, aren't they? Because when someone's life is so, your span in a lifetime is always difficult to cram it in the uh, an hour and a half or whatever that is. Um, no, that would, that, I mean, that would be, by the way, that would be so much fun because what a, what a complex character who yeah. has been around for so long making some, I, I'm a huge, huge fan and like, 
huge Van fan, and I see Van quite a lot because he sits outside the same cafe in Hollywood like pretty much yeah. every day. And also, like someone who was doing something at a time when this place was in like disarray, and he's doing this thing that's like taking over the world. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, there's something really special about that. I'd love to delve into that period of time. And it's one where, like, uh, I mean, I've never met him personally, but being from Hollywood, that's where he lives. And small towns, he, everyone knows about everything. And people are like, he's very, he's very short with people, and he's, you know, he's grumpy. And it's like, I have zero problem with that if you're like that with everyone, which he appears to be. Yeah. Also, by this point, if you've heard that a few times, surely you should go. You know, I'm not going to go near him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. And then but also. I'd I'd love to do I'd love to be do a western and I'd love to do a and I'd love to be a real scumbag like Southern America that'd be class yeah like Owen Brothers you know like something that that'd be class um is say you had to say you had to pick I mean is act would acting be way overwriting for you or are they starting to catch up with each other um I I, I, I yeah no yeah like I it depends on what day it is and also like. Is it, it's like you like do you like does writing your sketches come more to you than act the being in your do you know what I mean? It's like it's a thing, it's a whole thing for you, it's a whole And sometimes and I, I suppose it depends on the on the, the thing. You might the, love writing one script more than you enjoy acting in a different thing, I guess. It's absolutely and then like when I like I'm writing on something at the minute with a mate and and, and we're doing that and there's been this year a few auditions have come in where I'm like will that get in the way of this script because this script means so much to me and when I read the scripts I go I don't love it that, that, so would I want to be doing this for three months that would take me away from writing this that's where you know there'll be a different role you will know I, I only want to do that this year I think it's that I think it'll j- jumps and changes you know and you can't you, you, I mean that, a huge problem of mine for years was yeah I would I would write something or I'd come up with this idea and one person would react negatively to it or tell me, like, no, not this time. Yeah. I would just leave the idea. You know, I'd park it and throw it away and never return to it. And it was only until, like, I, I had a chat with a friend who's stand-up as well. And he said, when you find the one that you really like, like, don't take no as a... And, I, and that's something, that's the project that, you you know, you and I are working on together to minute as well. Um, Do you see the thing with that as well? Is like, you... you uh you know yeah yeah you yeah you yeah know, like you know and so it, it then when you know that much and it hurts you that much that someone says no you know there's something in there and what's what's brilliant to watch is someone's like integrity someone's belief someone's like drive behind it that's when it, things are electric and like if you're like that then you go along with them i think yeah and you know it wasn't even a thing of of having hurt feelings it was just a case of when i got into doing comedy all this kind of thing I was like 18 19 and all you're trying to do is what you think people want you like commissioners or producers you know it's like what do you want from me and and you're more thinking about what they want as opposed to the thing you want to do so um so I would I would have quickly been like I've got this idea you ask one person they might turn it down but the next person might say yes but I was I was always too focused on you know I have to get something made Whereas now it's like, find a thing I want to write about and then get it made. You know what I mean? Yeah, who should? Just it's like, that, isn't it the Revenant? Like, didn't they, the Revenant was 18 years in the making because they refused to back down on how they wanted to shoot it. And like, yeah, it, I wouldn't go 18 like, years on this. No, no, no. no. <laughs> we give it, give it up. Get, yeah, try, I'd just literally park it out. 18 years, he's still pedaling like that and he's yeah. still, still like going to be in it and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it 18 weeks. <laughs> Yeah, I play a schoolboy in this as a 54-year-old <laughs> actor. <laughs> I did, I swear to God, just give me a chance. Um, I <laughs> like, well, I mean, I think anyone can play anything nowadays after seeing Robert De Niro and the Irishman and that scene where he kicks a guy in the ground. Anyone can be any age. It's fine. I know, that was mad, wasn't it? I loved I it. Everybody hated it. it and I loved it. I, I liked it because I didn't think it was a classic film. I didn't think it was an iconic film. But I just enjoyed watching all those actors together, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed it for what it was. But the scene where he's kicking the guy in the ground, and he looks like a man of his age kicking the guy in the ground, just don't have that in. Leave it out. Just leave that, or, or, or have someone off, off screen be like, he's kicking that fella over there, and then cut <laughs> to him going. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I mean, what do you, what, like, 
in the next say year is your is your goal to just focus on acting focus on writing well it's kind of like i'm doing i go back to industry end of the year uh i'm shooting something now here i'm shooting something next month so that brings me up to like march and then if a wee window there where um one of the things i'm writing on i'm gonna have to be working on that and then i'd start industry again hopefully in you know mid or late next this year um and then that brings you in the next. so it's kind of all done and then after that fingers crossed the project me and doran's then hopefully will be somewhere at a point where we're able to to do it you know and and so yeah it's good it, just do both and wait and see you know i gotta got confess something too like this this really embarrassing the thing that we're for project that we're working on together um when i first came up with the idea of, for it before you you and i were in contact um i can i was doing like a treatment and i was putting some some faces on roles and i was like maybe this person can play this person you and i've never met but i put i put you down and thought like you know that i think you know that guy would be the guy for this even though we've never met yeah and i have like a microsoft word document that's clearly dated <laughs> before we met because i was like the first time we talked i was going should i say because that's a fun coincidence should i yeah. have said that to you the first time we met and i was like he will think that i'm just saying that to you, know, be, you know just, <laughs> Dude, just I, i'm really good mates. one of my mates is a casting director and i really we were like brilliant mates like really best friends and uh i had emailed her i found in my emails 10 years ago <laughs> Sending a CV <laughs> headshot, being like, would be so, uh, would such a pleasure to meet up with you at some point. Very best wishes, you're sincere. <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> I was such an admirer uh, of all the things that you work on. Like, it's so embarrassing. I so couldn't. Embarrassing. I couldn't look at that. I emailed the producer that makes the blame game on BBC when I had <laughs> done when I had done three gigs, three gigs. I sent him an email, and I still have the same email account. And I said, um. You know, just you know, let you know I like the program, and just to let you know, I do stand up now. So if you need anyone, come and see me. And to be fair, he emailed me back and said, <laughs> "Fuck <laughs> off!" No, he didn't. He said, uh, "You're never getting on the blink." <laughs> yeah, I've been on the radio one, but it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> but he said he was like, uh, "Listen, best of luck. It's great to see you're doing stand up. Keep it up, that sort of thing." Um, but it's just funny the emails. Yeah, you were all you were looking to do is like, love to meet up. You know, love to get a chat. I mean, it's. I don't think you should ever lose that. You know, no. you can definitely. You ever see a brilliant one with Bradley Cooper in the audience of the actor studio? Like that, isn't it like? Yeah. Desperate to know and desperate to be part of it, like. Yeah, very keen, uh, enthusiastic. Uh, yeah, I mean that. I would cringe at seeing seeing all my emails like that again. So and it was like, and like this guy was I'd the limit. Be, like, I'd love to see my old email name. I think it was like. Uh, Connor Fire 2006, something like it. it's like Flamey Fire, something. Like it's a good. My first email address, but not the email address I emailed people at when I started stand up. My right. first email address was Rio. Right now, this this is so weird. Rio. Now, bear in mind, I'm like 13. Rio under slash Ferdinand under slash rules with a Z at hotmail.com. Why the rules? Just do the crack. Why the Z? The Z, because it was like real Ferdinand rules, but I didn't want to write it like a nerd, so I put a Z on the end. Oh, uh, so bad. Um, Do you remember my mate said to me the other day in a message, ASL? Do you remember that? I was like, H HX location. Do you remember, um, uh, what was that, MSN message? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was on MSN. <laughs> stranger out of you. Which, by the way, how many strangers out of you on MSN messenger? And you just <laughs> chatted to them. Like, see, when I look back at it, I'm like, definitely not, none of that was safe. Like, none no. of it was safe. And I remember there was a, way before Facebook, like way before MSN days, there was a, a website called Face Party, which was like the first, it was like a really early carnation of Facebook. You probably were on it. Everybody right. used it. And I remember you would just chat the random people like MSN, but it had pictures. And I remember whenever I was about 14, I mean, it could have been a 55 year old man, but I was chatting to this girl about the same age who lived in Wolverhampton, right? Why was it doing it? Just quite random. Start That's chatting, it. and I remember sending a message, being like, "I might be in the area soon." And I was like, "At fourteen, <laughs> when was I ever going to be in Wolverhampton?" Then you drop by. <laughs> <laughs> How creepy would it have been if I dropped by? So sketch, like so sketch. MSN Messenger. Do you remember an MSN Messenger? You could do this thing on Windows Media Player where you could let 
MSN know what you were listening to music wise, so you would try and listen to cool music. Do you, do you remember as well, Bebo Legs? It was Bebo Legs used to kill me. Like, if nobody sent you love that day, or if, like, Top friends. someone moved you from the, like, like ah, really? I, Savage. Like, and having to go into school the next day and trying not to say anything about it, because you yeah. didn't want to, like, absolutely got it. Yeah, you're crying about it, and your dad's like, oh, you're still my top friends. You're like, I'm your one friend. <laughs> Bebo, oh man. Where are our Bebo accounts? Where are they now? Um, you remember Jeeves? I'm from Ask Jeeves. Yeah. Jeeves is keeping them all. Yeah, um, I said love. It was pictures and all in there. I'd probably like to see. Oh, imagine! Oh, do you remember that time? Because we were the same age, the look in Bebo days was the hair was like the same length at the minute on top. But like, and by the way, we were, we were on a Zoom call a couple of days ago, and someone who were in nameless slagged my hair and said it looked like Peter Schmeichel when he yeah. played for Man United, uh, which has really got to me. But do you remember you would grow your hair a wee bit at the back? Not like a mullet and like flick it out a wee bit. No, me neither. Anyway, yeah. Connor, great to chat to you. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. But I used to do short back and sides and leave the fringe. Short, short back and sides, one, the two on the top, leave the fringe. Now, and with then, the fringe, and, were you going up or were you going down? Oh, down, mate. I would, I would wax it onto my head. Like oh, chip. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, like the spider? I the spider thing? Spider, uh, like oh, a, I remember going, I remember a guy in my class called Michael shaved my head, like I asked him to, shaved my head one all over. Kept the fringe and would dyed it with his mum's dye peroxide blonde. Absolute legend. Cla- like genuinely look class. Did, did all the girls at school love you? Eh? No, I wasn't ahead with the girls from primary school. Uh, the first girl I ever kissed was in P7. And shout out to her if she's watching now. She's called Rachel. And <laughs> she'll know who she is, right? And uh, she was only Rachel in my class. And um, it was P7. I went to Shantown Primary School. Uh, P6, P7. And um, one of her friends who also knows who she is, Anita, uh, came up and said, Anita you that was her name, um, she came up to me and said, uh, Rachel like wants to know if you want to kiss her before we go in for lunch. And I was like, 100%. And I went <laughs> up, went up, Clear. quick kiss, thought I was the Fawns, right? Thought I was the quarterback of the high school football team. I'm sorry, can I just check, did you have the fringe at this point? No, I think I did the fringe as a reaction to what happened here. Confidence. Um, confidence. Went up, gave her a kiss, thought I was the man. Went back into class, found out about a week later she was only going out with me because her mate dared her and she was bet 50p to kiss me. And that has honestly made me the man I am today. And if she's watching, you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I honestly hope things have not worked out for her. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Yeah, imagine, imagine I still had a real complex with that. In counselling and all, all the time. <laughs> That's why I want to watch your ad with the cardboard box. The ther- therapist literally being like, Shame, I can't talk about this anymore. Seriously, we've done this. <laughs> you have to see, stop going back here. See, see in my living room across from me, there's a 50-foot cardboard box uh, I really need to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to carry out the industry? Connor, um, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for, for coming on. Um, I'll chat to you soon. I love it. I'm enjoying the fleece. Thank you very much. Do you know what? It was very cold in here at the start, and now look how red I am. It's absolutely roasting. Yeah. Because um, of the fleece. It's all good. See you later, All right. Mate. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.